I am honored to have on stage, to welcome on stage, John Hoffman, CEO and director at GSMA. Please put your hands together for John Hoffman. Thank you very much for being here. John, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Wow, what a great afternoon as we uh, are getting you know, into the final throws of Four Years From Now, our sixth uh, Four Years From Now program. And just a reminder that all of you are invited, encouraged, and required to attend MWC tomorrow at uh, Fira Gran Via. So as we are now approaching the best of the best to select this year's most innovative, advanced, and the winner of the Four Years From Now trophy as the best startup, it's my distinct honor to welcome you here and thank you for all of your time, effort, support, and your ability to make four years from now the place to do business. So without further ado, we have five finalists that you're going to hear from. Our judges will then, I don't know, randomly flip a coin, take money, but somehow pick the best of the five. So without further ado, the stage is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And so, as he was saying, we, had ha we have had more than 200 applications for these five spots that we will see today. Five startups, five pitches, only one will win the Stratospheric Award that we will be handing today. How will it work? Pretty straightforward. Each startup will be given five minutes to pitch. We will be very strict. I already told them that I will be rude if they go on beyond their five minutes. And they will have two minutes of questions. So very brief question from our jury and very brief answer from our startup. The jury will evaluate and decide which of these startups is the winner based on four key criteria. Innovation, viability, market, and team. The jury is definitely a first-class jury that I would like to welcome on stage. And the first one is Fabian Gruner, investment manager at Holt Spring Ventures. Big round of applause for Fabian, if he is here. Here you are. One more round of applause as he gets on stage, please. Thank you very much. How are you, Fabian? Thank you very much for being here with us. Next up, we have Ton van Nordende, a deep tech investor at Zero One Ventures. Big round of applause for Ton. <coughs> Thank you for being here with us. Next up, we have Lauren Cook, executive TMT advisor at X Telecom. Big round of applause for Lauren as well. Lauren, thank you very much for being here with us. And Marcet Tell, managing partner at Neco Capital. Big round of applause for her as well. Thank you very much for being here with us. Jury, I am honestly not jealous of you. I am sure this will be a very difficult decision, but obviously you will be able to witness from very close up the entrepreneurs that will be pitching to get this award. The first entrepreneur we have on stage they are not nervous at all. I was speaking with them backstage. They're not shaking, not nervous. They're like, oh, this, I'm, I'm so good. And the first one is Vadim Rogovsky, CEO at 3D Look. Big round of applause. He does need your heat. <laughs> Vadim, hey. best of luck. The stage is yours. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Vadim Rogovsky, and I'm CEO and co-founder at 3D Look. So our mission is to unlock a huge potential of physical, uh, physical body data of online consumers. And we strongly believe that if businesses will finally know how their consumers actually look like, they will be able to make much more powerful business decisions, such as invent better inventory planning, better merchandising, better marketing campaigns, and et cetera, et cetera. And also combined with existing data about consumers that businesses already have, such as social data, behavioral data, and geolocational data, it will unlock a, new, a, a completely new dimension of, uh, of valuable consumer insights. Uh, so how are, how are we collecting this data? 
by using uh, proprietary and patent pending technology that uses computer vision, deep learning, and 3D geometry, at ne and needs just two photos, front and side, made uh, taken from any smartphone. So uh, all we need is just two photos and, and, uh, and height of the person. Two photos, 10 seconds. And, and uh, we obtain a set of uh, 24 accurate body measurements, such as chest, waist, hips, anything you can imagine. Uh, and uh, we create the 3D avatar. And uh, uh, by uh, so uh, so uh, by connecting, uh, like uh, by creating a data exchange between businesses and 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 uh, and the consumers, we pla we are planning to collect the biggest database of human body profiles in, in the world, and to reach at least 100 million pr uh, profiles in. Uh, for years, and what types of data do we compute? So, uh, not only, uh, 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 of course, besides measure, besides 24 measurements, uh, body shape, and 3D avatar, we also compute uh, uh, anything that you can take from photo: a nationality, gender, age, and uh, device ID, and uh, other data points. Uh, and we decided to focus on retail first, because this industry is obviously suffering from huge problem, which is returns. And uh, this, this problem is, is estimated to hit uh, $480 billion this year. And uh, every retailer and fashion brand in the world is trying to figure out how to reduce returns and increase conversion rate. And I assume that you, uh, you guys, you, uh, you, uh, you are often buying uh, clothing online, and obviously your, your return may be a good portion of that, just because of wrong fit. That's exactly the, the problem from consumer perspective that we are going to, to solve. We created two solutions on top of our technology. The first one is size recommendation. So it's, it's mobile SDK, or API, that is implemented inside a customer journey, inside retailer's mobile app or website. Or, or white label there, and when a consumer goes there, uploads just two photos, uh, he, uh, he instantly gets a size recommendation of the garment that would definitely fit him. And uh, another solution also uses two photos to show how this garment will fit his body in 3D or, or even in augmented reality. Uh, so Look is, is a clear technology leader at, at, at the moment, especially after, after Body Labs was acquired by Amazon. Uh, so we have the only one technology on the market that can measure dressed people. No one else can measure dressed people. Uh, we can identify people on any background. It works super fast, 10 seconds, and we also support selfies in the mirror. Uh, so we have a solid enterprise traction already by uh, running commercial pilots with companies like H&M, uh, Nike, VF Corp, to name, to, to, to name a few, and already have a, a group of uh, smaller paying clients, and, a set, of, uh, and a, a set of big partnerships from companies from different segments on this market. The founding team is a well-balanced combination of enterprise software, product management, deep technology, and fashion retail and manufacturing experience. And our advisors represent such leading uh, fashion consulting and venture companies such as uh, Nike, PVH, L Brands, Goldman Sachs, NEA, and others. And uh, in its recent report, Morgan Stanley has asked an interesting question. Could 3D body scanning become the, the biggest retail disruptor since the invention of the internet? So what do you think? Thank you. Thank you very much, Vadim, and congratulations with the time. Very good, very well timed. Anyone in the jury who wants to make a question? Thanks, Vadim. I, I find this a great issue for several re reasons. One, of course, is the sustainability ang angle, right? It's a giant waste of, uh, of all the okay. returns. I mean, the question here, of course, it's um, this technology has been around and been used by startups for you know, decades. Same with AR. What would you think? Why is the moment now for retailers to, to actually adapt to technology? Yeah, thanks. That's a very good question. So now, yeah, some, some startups tried to make it too early and they failed because technology was not there. So neural networks were not as developed as they are now. Uh, uh, secondly, consumers were not there. They were not used to upload photos. They were not used to, so it, it changed a lot since 2009, 2010. And also retailers started to invest money 
in AI, finally, like, like two, three years ago. So like all these factors, I mean, together, <clears throat> they prove that now it's, uh, it's the right time. Fantastic. We still have one minute, so go ahead. Thanks. Great pitch. Um, one question from my side is you basically solving the customer side of the problem, but then there's also another side, basically um, the supply chain that you need to um, also be able to produce towards these measurements. Yeah. Are you planning to attack that as well, or what is necessary from the other side of the equation? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't have m much time to mention that, but it's a very good question because we, o we also, yeah, another side is consumer problem, but there is a business side, and we supply businesses with body data about their consumers. Just imagine that fashion brands finally will know how we look like and they will be able to create garments like and by knowing how their target audience actually looks by the, all the body shapes measurements etc because they don't know it now and it's the main problem of returns huge waste etc etc fantastic thank you very much big round of applause for Vadim congratulations you. you hand that one to the oh, next okay, entrepreneur yeah, yeah. directly and next up, we have Steve Goyet, Partnership Manager at CarFit. Please, big round of applause to welcome and stay Steve Goyet. <laughs> Best of luck. You have five minutes. Hi, everybody. 132 icons. Is it too much? Yes, of course it's too much. However, they are still missing information on your dashboard, especially on the wearing parts of the driving gears like tires, wheels, brakes, shock absorber. No car tell you that you have unbalance issues, misalignment problem, or a wrapped disc. So CarFit has developed a technology that treats the vibration of your car to anticipate maintenance needs on these wearing parts. We do that for cars in circulation with a connected device that you just need to affix on the steering wheel, on the dashboard, or on the windshield. It collects vibration data, it sends the data to the cloud, we analyze it, and we're able to predict maintenance for cars in circulation. Of course, the future of mobility is autonomous cars, but when you think about that, autonomous cars means no driver. If there is no driver, who? is going to manage the maintenance of the vehicle and make it safe. So CarFit is positioned to make this possible. How we do that? Basically, we combine NVH science, noise, vibration, harshness science, with artificial intelligence. This allows us to build initial models that we have embedded into our aftermarket device. And now, edge processing is allow, uh, is uh, possible to retrain the model and send all the data to the cloud. By doing that, each car is learning. And once they have learned something, they are able to teach it to all the other cars. So we have two different business models. The first one for the aftermarket. We basically sell this device to auto care services and car dealerships. Basically, they want to uh, have a loyalty program for their customers. So they are alerting when the um, car needs to be maintained, and they are able to alert the driver to uh, bring customer back to their store. We also work with parts and car makers on native integration. Basically, we sell our software, our NVH signature library, and uh, they will be able to propose predictive maintenance for future cars. We have some competitors. On the aftermarket side, there are many companies who are making OBD device, but they can't monitor the wearing parts because there, there is no sensor on these parts. OEMs could add more sensor, but that means more weight, cost, and complexity. At CarFit, we think that leveraging our data set and our knowledge base and using NVH science to anticipate maintenance needs is the solution. We are a global startup. We are an expert team in data science, NVH, and edge machine learning. We have a joint lab with the CEA, which is a research center uh, in France, uh, which is the second most innovative research center in the world. And uh, we have received investment from Jaguar Land Rover UK, the Mobivia Group, the Bernard Group, and several tech VCs. We have been also part of several acceleration programs, the Impact Connected Car program. You can meet some of the people here at the event, and also the plug and play and the Startup Autobahn uh, program. 
Of course, 132 icons is too much, but the future of dashboard in no, is not based on icons, so bringing more services based on vibration analysis is what we do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. And let's go on with the questions. Hi there. Um, question for you. How do you guarantee the quality of the retrofit in the cars? And then who are you selling that data to, to quantify? Can you repeat? How can you qu guarantee the yes. quality of the retrofit so that it's the same in multiple installations, right? So how are you going? That's a very key component. You have this great technology, but somehow you have to ensure that your installers are going to be consistent, right? We've got multiple cars, yes. right? Mo multiple years, most, multiple issues. How are you going to ensure the quality, number one? And number two, the data that you're collecting, who are you quantifying and selling that to? Yes, so basically we, uh, we have started with common issues to all cars. So for instance, unbalanced issues is a good problem for us because uh, you can have an American pickup truck or European compact car, the vibration signature is the same when you have uh, unbalanced issues. So we have started with these kind of issues. And basically what we do to collect this vibration data, at the beginning of the, of the process, we have done a lot of manual work uh, with our car dealership partner. Who every time they are buying back a car, we drive it, we collect the vibration data before and after the maintenance. This, this is how we basically uh, grow our knowledge base. And um, this is what we do. So, and the second question was? And who are you selling it to? Who are you selling this knowledge base to? So the knowledge base is sold to uh, basically car retailers, dealerships, uh, auto care services such as Midas or Noroto, for instance. And uh, on the native integration side, we sell this to the OEM, so car manufacturers. Very good, thank you. One more question. I was going to ask also on the business model. You said two different business models. How do you charge and for what? So is it for the device? Is it for the data? Yes, so for the aftermarket, uh, we sell the device, the software, and uh, the management tool, so a dashboard for uh, uh, the fleets. And for the native integration, we just sell the hardware. We collect vibration data from existing accelerometer of the car, because there are many accelerometers in the vehicles. So we collect this acceleration data, X, Y, Z data, and we process it. Maybe a really quick question. If I ask you to choose right now between, let's say, native integration or the aftermarket, what's your pick? I would say native integration, but we need the data from the aftermarket to propose this for the future, uh, of course. So this is, we can't do the native integration without the data we, co we are collecting now. Excellent. Thank you very much, Steve, and Thank big you. round of applause for him. Thank you so much. Thank you, and congratulations. <laughs> Next up, we do have Jordi Romero, founder and CEO at Factorial. Big round of applause for him. <laughs> I hear some Hello. love out there. Yes, I want to shake your hand. Best of luck. You've got five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jordi. I'm CEO and founder of Factorial. So did you know that more than 70% of the workforce works for a small and medium company? And actually, you know what SMEs are terrible at is taking care of their employees. No SMEs have good technology for HR. Providers are terrible. And many professionals in HR are actually in charge of finance, office management, even operations of the company. So we saw that there's a huge opportunity in helping these SMEs um, actually take care of their people. What Factorial does is we offer a free software that allows any small and medium-sized company around the world to take care of their people. We let them manage their vacations, um, org chart, documents, contracts, and so on and so on. We did that. We started that two and a half years ago. And now we're around 40 people. We're based in Barcelona. And our goal is to have as many companies using our platform for free, and then we allow some of them, currently only in Spain, to improve their HR by actually running all of their labor advice on top of the platform. So anything from creating a contract for the employee, uh, paying the pay slips, uh, terminating an employee when somebody gets sick, when somebody goes on vacation, uh, running reports on all your PayPal data. All of this is done on our platform. We currently have over 30,000 companies using the platform. Um, we have still most of our companies uh, 
uh, coming from Spain. But I would like all of you, if you're coming from abroad, to give it a try. Uh, use us and help us spread the word. The platform is currently in Spanish and in English. Uh, this year, we're doing a very, very heavy investment in translating that and localizing that into more than 12 languages. Um, so hopefully, by the end of this year or next year, at four years from now, we'll be happy to say that we have like a lot more companies from outside of Spain using us. Um, that's all from me. I'll be open to questions from the jury. And thank you very much. Please go ahead yeah. with the questions. So, so Yuri, we, uh, we know each other for a while. I mean, so one of the things that you've done really well in a year and a half is you've created some initial traction, 30,000 customers. You're integrating you know, the benefits and the pay, pay role platform into one solution. It makes sense. What I'm interested in most in is how are you going to scale up in terms of onboarding from 30,000 to, let's say, 100,000 users, because it's, it's going to be a struggle. There's much more companies in this space as well. So yeah, obviously, um, we can talk to 30,000 companies. Uh, so our product is key. We have like a big technological team, uh, product developers, designers, and so on. And uh, what we do is we make it very, very easy for these companies to first learn what they're supposed to do. Because again, SMEs, they usually don't know pretty much what HR is supposed to be. Uh, so we have like a lot of content in our blog. We're starting a podcast now with HR stars. And then we tell them, like, this is what HR looks like. Then the product kind of guides them through the process. And employee uh, onboarding needs to be super easy. Uh, HR good practices need to be baked into the product. And you know, we did some of that. It took us to where we are here. But you know, we still have to do a lot uh, in the next few years. Uh, thanks, Jody. Great presentation, very focused. Yeah. Um, who, are, who are you mostly competing or pitching against when you close a customer? So most of the SMEs around Europe and mostly around the world, uh, they don't have a large enough team to take care of HR internally. So most of them actually outsource to uh, labor advisors or accounting firms, depending on the country. They call them one way or the other. Uh, these providers are actually what we're competing against. Uh, they're offline. They have software. They have technology. But it's in their premises. It's on their desktop computer. It's not even in the cloud. And the customer, the end company, doesn't have any access to this data. Uh, so what we're doing is uh, we lend with a free software to these companies. And then we tell them, imagine what these guys do, we can do. But then the data is in the cloud. You can run reports. You, know, you can access this anytime. You don't need to call us to get an answer. And they're a lot more autonomous. We do have time for one more question, definitely. Go ahead. Okay. And what about scaling? Uh, so every country, in terms of HR, has got specific regulation. How are you dealing with that? So scaling? Um, so having companies that um, have some people in different countries, are you able to manage the payroll, let's say, for the whole company? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so as I said, I would say there's like three layers of what we do. There is a global uh, core HR solution uh, that is like employee database, uh, org chart, vacations, onboarding, offboarding. This is global. This, you know, the concepts are the same everywhere. Then we're also working on this payroll workflow software that helps guide the process of payroll. When an employee comes in, we need a certain set of uh, data to create this contract. And then when the payroll cycle is done, we need to collect inputs and then generate payroll and then give it back to the, to the company. This is more or less global. But then there is a super specific thing, which is actually doing the calculations. This is social security, tax agencies, et cetera, et cetera. And this, right now, we're only doing in Spain. Uh, so we will need to replicate all of these calculations and this part of the stack uh, to every country that we want to sell our premium offering. But we're happy to have uh, free users worldwide. Uh, we, we don't care if today we're not able to charge everybody who's using Factorial. Like eventually, we'll get there. I'm going to have to cut you there. Thank you very much, Jordi. Big Thank round you, of applause. Thank you so much. And next up, we have Iren Fine, CEO and co-founder at Nanolog Security. Please give, put your hands together for Iren Fine. Here he is. Thank you so much. Best of luck. The stage Thank is you. yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Aaron Fine, co-founder and CEO of Nanolock. We are providing protection and management of IoT-connected devices. Uh, just to warm up, I'll hack one. So in four years from now, we'll have billions or tens of billions of devices. The poor guys will not be protected or managed. Um, we chose to start with a security camera. And I will ask my CTO with the USB that I provided him with a off-the-shelf, easily hackable, um, tool to hack the unprotected system. Once this is done, you're gone. I apologize, but like in the bottom camera, we just took you off like in Mission Impossible 3, 4, or 5. I don't remember which one of the movies. Unlike um, the protected camera and the management system above me, which has the nanolock protection inside that will do two things. It will prevent 
and report to the service provider that somebody is trying to hack the camera. It could be a camera, this could be a router, this could be an industrial controller, this could be a security um, a, um, smart meter, and this could be an ECU in the car. We work with all of those customers in Japan, US, Germany, France, and the Netherlands. So you have a, an alert here, and I will ask Mark now to put our uh, presentation um, on the screen so I can continue with the standard pre presentation. What is common to all of the devices I've mentioned before is one, they do not have the computing power, the energy, or the operating system to have their own protection, that's number one. Number two, the enterprises and the service providers managing and running them need to know, A, that they're protected, and number two, that they're safe and managed. Nanolock is providing a management tool and a protection tool to telcos, cloud companies, OEM, and industrial companies allowing them either to protect and manage the devices or offer a service to protect and manage the devices. We've come with a technology that is CPU, processor agnostic, OS agnostic, thus can serve each and every device out there in the market today and in the future, and of course, ready for the 5G revolution. The way we do that is by taking the root of trust, the way that the device and the management system are communicating out of the device. Anybody that will hack into the device, by the way, with a physical access, with a network, by stealing your credentials and your usernames, will not be able to hack. This is a ironclad, extremely powerful tool to do that. How do we do that? We have an agent inside the memory of the device. So it's common to all of those devices is the non-volatile memory. We collaborate with Micron, a $50 billion company we're actually presenting here at MWC. Cyprus, we're presenting this week at Embedded World in, Mun in uh, Nuremberg. We're collaborating with um, a company called Windborn from Taiwan, and there are three more vendors to come. We're covering 90% of the IoT market, which is nanolock enabled. We are coming to the telco and saying there's no hardware cost, there's no premium, there's nothing on the device side. It's the same price. You pay for the features. You pay for the protection, you pay for the alerts, you pay for the information, you pay for the fact that everything that comes is signed and verified. We secure the channel between the cloud and the device. The cloud can be with one of our customers, Thales in France, this is public, but can be with one of the telcos that we work with. We work with telcos in Asia, in two countries, and in Europe, and so on and so forth. So this is a model where the telco and the service provider, the enterprise, enjoys a wealth of services, features that they can generate money from, while the device owner is protected. We have an impact, we have customers both in Asia, as I've said, and uh, in Europe, we raised $6 million in Q1 2017 after we had the first customer, an American car maker, and we're now doing a $15 million round with some of the names I've mentioned before participating in the round. This is a real-life example of a service, and you see at the bottom, devices protected by Nanolock, in the middle, a management system, as you saw before, and a SOC, Security Operations Center, where those alerts are going to. So you have protection, reporting, and alerts. The team behind the company, uh, we founded the company, uh, Mr. Kreiner, the former head of the Cybersecurity Authority of Israel, and myself. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Yoni Kahanda, the former head of GM, General Motors Cybersecurity R&D, um, joining us. Uh, Dorit Parsek, who's the head of R&D, who came from Celebrite, and NICE Celebrite is a cyber company. Uh, Eliran Modan, VP Products, who came from NICE Systems, before that a, for, a fighter pilot in the Israeli Defense Forces, and Itzan Daube, who is our CTO, and this is, this is my pleasure to have a second startup with him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and congratulations, Iran. I don't need that one, but you thank you it? very much. There's a red button here. Uh, no, I don't want to push the red button. Let's okay. move forward to the questions. Two minutes for the questions. So around action presentation, you managed to put a lot of information in five minutes, which is great. Uh, it also shows that you're a little bit further on than the other startups in this competition right now. I mean, what percentage of telcos have you already targeted with solution? And then so the next question would be, what would the next market be where you're going to enter in? So it's telcos and, op and, and cloud companies are fighting and collaborating. So we are working both with the telcos, the classic telcos, and the cloud. So um, AWS have their own flavor. Um, Microsoft Azure and some of our partners are going that way. So our approach is unique as we chose a top-down approach and not a bottom-up approach in order to facilitate the market. So we, we showed there's money. We're making revenues already. There's a demand. So telcos, cloud companies, and we're seeing some of the large system integrators 
in Europe and in the US also join to the party because IoT is not a market yet. It's a solution-based market and not commoditized. So you have a lot of customers coming and saying, okay, here's a sizable project. Can you assist me with it? And this is part of uh, where we're going. One more question. How easily scalable is your product and, and what, how many devices can you scale to? Um, we're not limited. So the architecture, I'll answer technically and then commercially. Architecturally, what, so first of all, it's not our cloud, it's, it's the customer's cloud. And the way we built the enterprise infrastructure is by services that can be API'd into their management system because some customers have their own solutions and we just API with their current solutions. Some of them are using this as their fundamental system, depends on the flavor of the customer. Um, and in terms of size, you just add more and more service. There's no limitation on that side. The real limitation is commercial. How do you get to sufficient enough devices? And we're doing a good job by working with Micron, Cypress, Winbond. The three more, some of them are size, as sizable as those names. So it's covering the majority of the market. One more quick question, real quick. Yeah, quick question. Um, I mean, your software is very security relevant. Do you face a trust issue? Do you need to guarantee anything to these large companies, as a startup especially? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a huge challenge. So nobody was fired for buying an, an IBM, and no was, nobody was promoted from buying a small startup from Israel. However, the, mar the go-to market is with the partners, and we have partners which are both the memory vendors with the flavor of not necessarily they know how to market those services, but we team up with the third layer with companies who are providing services. The, um, I cannot say the names, but these are guys who are coming with those kind of solutions and offer the entire umbrella of services to the giants. Having said that, we saw that the telcos are so eager to solve this and, and generate revenues that some of them, including in the complicated uh, countries like Japan and others, are willing to work with startups as long as they see that we're doing a good job. I'm going to have to cut you there. Thank you very much. And big round Thank of you. applause for Iran. Thank you so much. Thank you. And definitely last but not least, we have on stage Mar Pallas Poi, VP Market Development at Scoot Networks, and Gerard Gomas, City Manager Barcelona at Scoot Networks. Big round of applause for them. Hello. Hi. And the stage is yours. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks for the organization for inviting us, and good luck for all the finalists as well tonight. So we are going to speak about Scoot. So Scoot was born because our founder and president, uh, he's an urban planner and he was studying large mega cities. And he thought that there must be a way to decrease carbon emissions and also that in most of the cities you could either go somewhere in a cheap way or go somewhere in a fast way. But he thought, what if we could move as fast of a taxi but for the price of a bus ticket? So that's why Scoot was born, because we found a way to go quick and to go in an affordable price as well. So at Scoot, we are a shared electric fleet, so our mission is to provide electric vehicles to everyone. And we are doing so being shared, but also being local. So we want to improve the mobility of the cities in a sustainable way. And what makes us special are three things. The first one is that we are local. At the moment, we are in San Francisco, in Santiago de Chile, and Barcelona. And everywhere we go, we employ people from the city. So we really invest on the local economy. Uh, one uh, example, for example, is that in Barcelona, what we did is to purchase local scooters in order to invest um, in, in the city. We are also multimodal. We have different types of vehicles because we believe that we need to provide a service to the customers. And it's not the same depending on the time of the day or the period of the year. You may have different needs. That's why we have scooters and kick scooters in San Francisco. In Chile, at the moment, we have kicks, but we will increase uh, our fleet as well with other types of vehicles. And in Barcelona, we have electric scooters and electric bicycles. And we are always innovating. Uh, for example, the last invention that we did is like to um, design a lock for kick scooters in order that people can attach that to the infrastructure. And then by locking it, we decrease the vandalism and the theft. Thank you very much, Mar. So these three vehicles and these three cities, they're just simple to locate. You just have to open the app. You 
take a helmet from the helmet box if needed, and just drive to the destination you want to go and drop it up there. And you just have to pay by price, by minute. And this, all this concept, it's, it's just not a business concept. It's, it's a reality, actually. So we've been operating here in Barcelona since June. We've been experiencing a three-digit growth month over month. And we're actually um, expecting to finish the year with a seven-digit amount of rides. This is generating more than 2% of the market share of e-bike rides, of bicycle rides, sorry, in the town, with a demand which is growing a lot. And this has only been possible thanks to a team of over 50 people that work in-house, which are working mainly to make sure that the quality of our vehicles has always the highest standards. But the best is yet to come. So the thing is, the market size, just here in Barcelona, it's over 600,000 two-wheel rides per day. The infrastructure capacity is huge. We have over 200 kilometers of bike lane in Barcelona, and they're still underutilized. They are, we only have two rides every, so sorry, one ride every um, two minutes in one of each of these kilometers. So we're just waiting for new vehicles to come, new vehicles to be deployed in town. And actually, we even have a third vehicle, which is the kick scooter, that we still haven't operated in Barcelona because the regulation is still not allowing it. But we have it ready for whenever the moment arrives. And the regulation part is really important because actually we know that the marketing, the market is, ask, is asking for our vehicles, is asking for our service. But we know that the only way to make it possible is through collaboration with the, with the institution, creating a collaborative framework, and also making sure that we do it in an organized and structured way. So overall, we believe from our experience that if we make sure that we put into our cities the best vehicles and we make sure that we do it in a, through a collaborative planning with institutions, we will make sure that our cities and also Barcelona will be much better and much, much more enjoyable for us in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and congratulations. And we have two Thanks. minutes. Okay. Yes, oh, for sure. We have two minutes for the questions. How do you prevent theft? How do you track your, your, your scooters? I mean, loss prevention it must be a big concern here, especially in cities, yeah? For sure. Um, in fact, all our vehicles are localized through GPS signal, so we perfectly know every moment uh, where our vehicles are. And we are, of course, in direct contact also with the police, because we, as we said, we are like collaboratively working with institutions. So we make sure that any time there's an incident, we can handle that. What's your, your uh, loss rate? Well, that, these are figures that we cannot disclose, but actually is, is really, really low. It's surprisingly low, especially for What we can say is that since we implemented the, the lock infrastructure in the kits in Santiago de Chile, we saw that our theft rate decreased. So in uh, two weeks, only one kick was stolen, and it was really a success because without a lock, it's uh, quite wild. Thank you very More much. Uh, very exciting market, a very, very big problem which you're addressing. Also, personally, I'm very excited about this. Um, also, very busy market with lots of competition in it. How important is it for you as a company to be a global company, active in many cities, and kind of what benefits do you draw out of this versus being local, doing it right in a few places? We are global and we are local at the same time. So what we try is to, to work with cities locally where we, are, um, we have operations, but at the same time to expand to other cities. So we selected San Francisco, Santiago de Chile, and Europe because we believe that are three cities that are key in order, in order to expand later on, on in, the, in the different continents. So that's why it's important like, to act locally, but also to be a global brand to have different uh, perspective. Last real quick question, real quick. How important is hardware and controlling hardware development? It is critical, actually. All our hardware is, in the, like when it comes to like, um, like te telecommunications, let's say, the telco is internally developed, uh, because we believe that that's the way to make sure that we are not dependent on a specific vehicle, and, and it's a way to really get um, all the data that we need and all the features that we need for our vehicles and our users. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Big round of applause Thanks. for...
Gerard and Mar, thank you very much and congratulations. So these were the five pitches of the five finalists that we selected out of 200 and now I am really not jealous of the jury who has to go backstage and make a decision in the next eight minutes. Big round of applause for the jury as well because it's not going to be very easy to do this. Just a reminder, we're not evaluating the quality of the pitch or the public speaking skills of the people that were on stage. What we are evaluating, again, is innovation, viability, market, and team of the startups that we just saw. Next on stage, I would like to welcome the winner of the Four Years From Now 2018 Awards Edition, Paul Carasso, co-founder at Bucks Motion. Big round of applause for Paul. Thank you. Definitely nope. a superstar. It seems. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you will be handing the award to the winner of the 2019. Oh, nice. We hope that the jury can do this in eight minutes. And eight minutes is what I give you to explain a little bit how this award changed you personally and also Box Motions, your Perfect. startup. Thank you very Stage much. Stage is yours, Paul. Hello, everyone. So imagine this is me. So then all this clutter is the stuff that I've got at home. But I am not an exception. Actually, on an average Western home, we've got up to 300,000 items, which weigh more than 800 kilos. Yes, we all collect a lot of stuff. Funny thing is, though, only 3% of these articles are used on a daily basis. In fact, one out of 20 people use self-storage because they lack space at home. The problem is self-storage, using self-storage, is a real hassle. My name is Paul Carasso. I'm co-founder and co-CEO at Box Motions, and I now will explain you how, after winning last four years from now awards, we're changing the way people store their stuff. So if any of you has ever used self-storage, you know what a pain it can be. First, you need to pack everything and haul your belongings to the nearest storage facility, which is 25 minutes away on average. Second, you completely forgot, forget what you've got in there. And third, you're stuck with static pricing. It's never easy to change a storage plan. That's why at Box, at Box Motions, we've made a storage simple. We come to your place, pick up your stuff, carry the stuff to the warehouse where we uh, store it uh, securely, and build an online catalog through which you can schedule pickups and deliveries whenever you need them, just a click away. It is that simple. So whereas self-storage gives you space, at Box Motions we give you space, on-demand transport, and the online catalog. And all that cheaper than self-storage. Yes, cheaper. So the question is, how do we achieve that? Well, by building a close relationship with our customers through technology and transport, we become location agnostic, which allows us to cut off storage costs by 70%. Being location agnostic uh, has three beautiful consequences in the business model. First, our customers don't need physical access to the, to the, to the services, to the units, so no need for expensive self-service facilities. Second, with one single warehouse, we cover an area, self-storage needs tens of them. And third, we round our warehouses as a top-notch uh, logistics center, so we are 30% more efficient in the use of space. So voila, here you've got a disruptive business model with dramatically lower storage costs and a far more convenient service. In addition, thanks to our technology, we have full visibility of all the articles that are in storage, which means that in the future, we will be able to provide upsell services never seen in the industry before, such as putting your bike on sale in a digital marketplace if we have detected that you haven't been using it for a while. The opportunity is huge. Only in Europe and Latin America, there's a total addressable market of 50 billion euros, out of which 2.4 billion euros are uh, customers already paying for traditional self-storage solutions. And it is a market which has been growing two digits in the last decade, with a demand which is resilient to economical crisis periods. 
Access to that market is easy, because it's a fragmented market. Actually, top 10 players have only 10%, uh, 15% of the market share. In addition, the traditional players, self-storage players, have a slow dynamics, because they are greatly attached to the real estate assets, and they have a good business model that works well for them, so they haven't been forced to look into innovation and technology to survive so far. What makes, what makes us special at Box Motions is that we don't only pick small items or boxes. We pick from boxes to couches, fridges, whatever you've got at home. And this is this focus in challenging heavy logistics that places us in a unique position to target a market 10 times bigger than competitors of battery storage uh, picking up only small items. To seize this opportunity, we have developed 70% of our technology for logistic optimization purposes. And while outsourcing, we hold control of operations because we believe that uh, excellent operational implementation is paramount uh, for, uh, for success in scaling this business model. The business model is very simple. We are both B2B and B2C. We've got 80% of our income monthly recurring coming from the subscription and 20% of income coming from transaction. We've got very healthy unit economics, having a lifetime value almost three times the customer acquisition cost. And as mentioned earlier, before winning this very same prize last year, four years from now, 2018, uh, we gained great exposure to the uh, European ecosystem, and we met uh, great investors, which has allowed us to multiply per five our monthly income uh, while maintaining excellent uh, customer, um, customer, um, customer satisfaction metrics, actually 4.8 uh, stars in, in Google reviews. We have raised 2.4 million euros in, in funds. We have opened new cities, and we broke the barrier of 1,000 new customers. But all that wouldn't have been able with the great team that we're building. The founders team is Alex Corbacho and myself. We are two aerospace engineers with complementary experience in tech intensive operations and sales strategy. We are leading a team of 34 great professionals from seven different countries. And in addition, we count as an advisor with Sasha Michaud, serial entrepreneur and co-founder of Glovo, who has great experience in scaling operational intensive business models. So last but not least, uh, what's for this year? We will continue to bring more space up to five cities in Europe. We will close our Series A fund, uh, um, round for investment. And overall, we will store more than 120,000 articles in storage. So maybe just mention a couple of more things. We are very happy to meet Series A investors. And as usual, we are hiring. And remember, at Box Motions, we make storage simple. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. So I, I just wanted to ask you, how nervous were you a year ago when you were off stage like our entrepreneurs are today? It wasn't me. It was my partner that might be here. It wasn't it was, you. It was Alex. It was Alex. Yeah. I wish Alex uh, was here to uh, tell us about it. But yeah, anyway, well, you were nervous for him because you're a team, right? Yeah, exactly. Anyway, <laughs> I want you to hold this award, Yep. which you will hand on to the next winners of the Four Years From Now Award. OK. It's nicer than last year's, huh? It's nicer than last year. <laughs> well, I'll talk to the organization okay. if, you, if, if that's needed. What I want to say, if you, wanna, if you can show it to our audience, we have a full pack. I love the people sitting on the floor and everything. It looks like a terminal. Yeah, yeah. And um, I just want to share a story, because this is the first award ever handed that has been sent to the stratosphere. This award was put into a shuttle, I don't even know the name of the, of the machine. The, uh, a, what? a balloon, a balloon, thank you very much. This is the team helping me out. A balloon, as we can see, and it was sent out to the stratosphere along with the dreams of people for the next four years. We asked dozens and hundreds of people, what are your dreams four years from now? And the award went with this. That's because we fundamentally believe that entrepreneurs will be core to making many of these dreams come true. 
So this, what you're holding now, and that we will hand to the winner of the 2019 Four Years From Now Awards, is the first award in history that has been to the stratosphere. And it's nicer than last year's. Absolutely. <laughs> Great, Paul, are you ready? <laughs> I will open the envelope for you. Okay. I hope nobody gets dizzy with the film. I will open the envelope for you and you will read out the name. I'll, I'll actually stand on the other side so okay. that you can hand the award. Much Great. smarter. So I'll have the pleasure. Everyone's shaking. Yeah, yeah. Are you guys looking forward to this? Yeah. I sense no energy from your side. <laughs> Are you guys ready for this? Yeah. Yes. That's the full room. Yes, a big applause for all the entrepreneurs because they're rarely nervous. I can't even feel my own heart beating. And? So the winner of, should I, yeah? The Go winner ahead. of uh, this year, four years from now awards is Nanolog Security. You're Nanolog Security. Aaron, <laughs> on this award. I think we, I'm just going to try and get you a microphone because you may want to say something. It, do you need help holding something? Nice. I can hold this one for you. Where's the money? <laughs> I don't know. Don't talk to me about that. Me plastic things. Give me the money. <laughs> it's no, been in the stratosphere. Oh, the stratosphere. So the check is in the email. Thank you. Uh, we'll make a safer world. We'll try to do that less than four years from now. Um, and I'll be here next year. Thank you. Good luck. Um, there were phenomenal startups, and I appreciate the support. I appreciate the audience. I appreciate the stage, and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Iran. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you to thank the you. jury. Thank you to all the entrepreneurs that were here on stage. Congratulations, Iran. And thank you all for coming here. Thank you for your support to all these entrepreneurs who are trying to make our dreams come true. And make sure to stay because next we have a session on healthcare that I've heard will be extremely interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best.